Marilyn did not want to look at her newborn son. She felt that he was not needed by her. She had wanted to get rid of him, but missed the deadline. After going through the pain of childbirth, she felt hatred towards the baby who made her suffer. The only midwife in the small village tried to bring the young mother to her senses, using persuasion and reproaches, but it was all in vain. Somehow they managed to make Marilyn feed her son, hoping that the maternal instinct would kick in, but it didn't happen. Marilyn, look at the little boy you've given birth to. He's so adorable. It's easy for you to say. You didn't have to listen to his cries at night, grumbled Marilyn, her lips trembling. She considered her life over. Who would marry her now with a baby in tow? She blamed the child and his father. Truthfully, Marilyn didn't know exactly which man it was, as she loved to have fun and hadn't pledged her faithfulness to anyone. What will you name the boy? They asked Marilyn in the hospital. I don't know. I don't even want to think about it. Well, maybe Norman. That was the name of the boy I loved back in school. He was so good, kind and devoted, but he died in an accident. I haven't met anyone like him since, sighed Marilyn. But it's a bad sign to name a child after a deceased person, complained the midwife. Oh, any name you choose is either a deceased person's or a dog's name, so let it be Norman, sneered Marilyn. She was angry at all men, even her stepfather, a former sailor with whom she hadn't spoken in two years. Bernard Costa lived on the outskirts of the village and served as a forester. After his wife's death, he rarely mingled with people and lived in seclusion. Bernard Costa strongly disapproved of his stepdaughter's way of life, as she loved to go out too much. Therefore, he did not give her any money, which made Marilyn furious with him. When neighbour Mrs. Banks came running to him with news from the village hospital, Costa only grimly shook his head, knowing that this was how it would end. "'What's happening, for heaven's sakes?' complained Mrs. Banks. "'Marilyn gave birth to a baby and abandoned him. "'She ran away from the hospital, and nobody knows where she went. "'She left only a piece of paper with my number in the ward. "'You don't even have a phone, and they called me, asking me to tell you to come for your grandson immediately.' "'Okay.' I'll go get him, sighed Mr. Costa. I've been telling you and Amy to spoil the girl less because she's growing up to be loose. Now you've got this. She went away and left her baby. Stop it, Mrs. Banks. Marilyn gave birth to my grandson, and that's all that matters. But where is she now? The neighbor persisted. Well, who knows where she went? She probably went to her apartment, shrugged Mr. Costa. Are you going to see her? asked Mrs. Banks. No, I'm not going. If she didn't invite me, it means she doesn't want to see me. At the hospital, Mr. Costa completed all the necessary paperwork and went home with a precious bundle in his arms. For the first time, his neighbour helped him around the clock, even bringing diapers and baby clothes for the little boy. She always stayed with Norman when his grandfather went to work. Mrs. Banks had tender feelings for Bernard Costa and secretly dreamed that he would marry her some day. However, the widower remained faithful to his late wife, Amy, and planned to live out the rest of his days alone. Mrs. Banks was angry at his stubbornness, but knew she couldn't do anything about it. Nonetheless, Norman considered the elderly woman his own grandmother and loved her with all his heart. The woman had also grown attached to the boy, who followed her everywhere. Bernard Costa loved his grandson too, how could he not love this clever boy, who was a copy of his beloved Amy? However, he tried to teach Norman discipline, so that, as the grandfather liked to say, he would grow up to be a real man, not a weakling. From a young age, Norman helped his grandfather in the forest and around the house. He was rapid and caught everything on the fly. Mr. Costa always knew that if Norman was given a task, it would be done flawlessly. Norman is a smart boy, Mrs. Banks said admiringly. He didn't take after his mother. By the way, is there any news from her? The elderly man just shook his head. There was no news from Marilyn. They said she had gone abroad and gotten married there, but he didn't know the truth. 
When Norman asked his grandfather about his parents, he never said anything bad about his mother. But as the boy grew older, he realized that a woman who abandoned her child could not be called a mother. He was happy with his grandfather and Mrs. Banks, but sometimes before going to sleep, he would quietly cry in his bed when he thought about how his closest person had betrayed him. The school that Norman attended was far from his home. First, he had to walk to the bus stop, wait for the bus, which sometimes came late, and then ride to school. In the first few years, his grandfather escorted him to the bus stop, but in the third grade, Norman started going by himself. But he still had a companion, called Skipper. The puppy was given to Norman by his grandfather in the spring, and he named him in memory of the hard but happy years of service in the fleet. During the summer, the pet became so attached to the boy that he followed him everywhere. He even escorted him to the bus and then met him after school. In the forest, Skipper was also his loyal companion. Although he was quite mischievous, he would chase after a rabbit and run away. Or he could start barking hysterically when he smelled the scent of some forest animal that you had to plug your ears with cotton. Once he even fell into a swamp and Norman had to pull him out of the mud. They both returned home dirty and wet and received a serious scolding from Mrs. Banks. When it was time for Norman to go to the city to study, he saw how Skipper was worried, sensing the separation from his master. The young man entered a forestry school and at first tried to come home as often as possible, and then Skipper had a real holiday. At the sight of his owner, Skipper happily yelped, wagged his bushy tail vigorously and danced joyfully. However, over time, there were fewer reasons for the faithful dog to be happy, because Norman visited his hometown less and less frequently. In the city, Norman experienced his first love. The guy tried to spend every free minute with his flirtatious girlfriend. Joan was a tall, shapely blonde whom he met at a party. She was studying to be a hairdresser and loved to have fun and party, and with her it was never boring. The stately but modest Norman caught the attention of a carefree girl who decided to shake things up with this country boy and invited him to dance at a friend's party. Norman blushed and felt shy, which amused Joan. She playfully laughed and flirted with him all evening and in the end made it a fact that he escorted her home. Norman brought his friend Ross to the party, who noticed that Joan had her eye on him. Ross was from the same village as Norman. They had not been friends before because Ross was older, but when they met in the dormitory, they were delighted to see each other and became friends. The morning after the party, Ross knocked on Norman's door. Norman, who had not slept all night, was thinking about a beautiful Joan. Understanding his friend's condition, Ross warned him not to get involved with this girl. Hey buddy, she is too flighty and breaks guys' hearts. It's better to keep far away from her. But Norman brushed him off. All day, all his thoughts were only about Joan, and in the evening, he gathered the courage to ask her out. He didn't expect Joan to agree, but the girl was not against taking a walk in the park. On the date, Joan behaved very modestly and was sweet and gentle. And Norman realized that Ross was just jealous of him, so he said mean things about the girl. When Ross tried to discourage Norman from these relationships again, the guys had a big argument. Joan had already spun the grandson of the forester's head, and he could no longer imagine his life without her. Norman studied and worked at the same time, so he was able to buy Joan a beautiful ring when he proposed. To his delight, the girl responded with consent and went with him to his hometown to meet his grandfather and Mrs. Banks. Skipper, Norman's dog, jumped for joy at the sight of his owner and began to bark loudly, trying to lick his owner's nose. He also intended to lick Joan, but the girl made it clear that she didn't like dogs. They reeked of dogs and could ruin clothes or bite a leg, she said. Therefore, she would prefer it if the dog did not leave the enclosure. They had to take the whining and resisting skipper to the enclosure and lock him up there. Norman and Joan visited for three days and all the while, poor skipper had to watch his beloved owner 
through the iron bars. At first, the dog waited for the main person in his life to open the door and play with him again. So when he saw him, he joyfully threw himself at the bars. But soon he realized that this would not happen. He began to whine pitifully and wag his tail on the ground when Norman passed by. The guy was so ashamed that he tried not to even look in the direction of his locked-up friend. Joan did not like Mr. Costa's modest home. The girl was capricious and pouted, and when Mrs. Banks asked her to help prepare lunch, she replied that she was not a cook or a chef. But how are you going to feed Norman? Mrs. Banks was surprised. Norman is a grown boy. He will cook for himself. He'll even feed me. I'm not a maid. I'm a woman. And if Norman needs a housekeeper, let him find someone from the local girls. Joan retorted. Look at this city girl, grumbled Mrs. Banks to herself, and went cooking alone. The elderly woman tried to talk to Norman about the bride, but the guy just waved it off. Modern girls don't want to be housewives, and that's all right, he said. Well, she won't want to have children with you either. She'll say it's not trendy, Mrs. Banks protested. I think it's too early to think about children now. We'll see later, defended Norman. Bernard, why are you silent? Don't you care? fussed Mrs. Banks. What should I say? It's their life. Let them live as they want. We don't understand them and they don't understand us, replied the elderly man. Mr. Costa had to cover the wedding expenses, since Joan's parents claimed they had no money, and the groom's side should take care of the wedding anyway. Norman suggested just getting married and not having a celebration, but Joan wanted a wedding and a fancy dress. Her friends envied her, because the girl was busy choosing a wedding dress instead of studying. Norman was looking forward to a happy family life, and rented an apartment where he planned to live with his young wife right after the wedding. However, a week before the scheduled date, Joan disappeared. Norman called all his acquaintances, but no one knew where the girl went. Some really didn't know, while others just didn't want to talk, because Joan was closer to them than Norman. Unable to bear it, the guy went to make peace with Ross, so he knew the guy was aware of all Joan's friends, so he must know something. Yes, I know where Joan is, and I wanted to tell you right away, but then I decided not to interfere in someone else's business. So, recently, a rich guy, Adam, started courting Joan. Gifts, restaurants, and night trips in his car. That's why Joan went with him. By the way, he lives in a settlement not far from yours. It's just that you have a backwater there, while they have an elite settlement away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Sorry, friend, but I warned you before, sighed Ross. So you know where he lives? Norman gritted his teeth. I do, but I won't tell you, so that you don't do something stupid. Fine, Norman replied. I'll find out from someone else. Wait, wait, idiot, shouted Ross after Norman, when the guy turned around and left his room. I'll tell you, but I'll come with you so that you don't do anything stupid. They're having a party tonight, so we'll get in without any problems. Just promise to keep a cool head and be reasonable. Norman agreed and they went. They didn't notice Joan among the guests at first, but as soon as Norman saw her in Adam's arms, he couldn't hold back and approached her. You having a good time here with my future wifey? Norman said sarcastically. Joan jumped in surprise, then lowered her eyes, and Adam laughed. Oops, the groom showed up. Did you miss your former bride? She dumped you, and you're crying. Yes, I missed her, Norman gritted his teeth. Joan, let's go home, that's enough. You've had your fun, he said, addressing his bride. However, she continued to stand silently with her eyes downcast. Joan, did you betray me? Norman asked, barely holding back from making a scene at the party. And then Joan looked up at him. No, Norman, you betrayed me. I thought we would live happily ever after, but then I saw how your family lived and realized that you would be a maximum forester and I would have to live in the countryside all my life. You didn't think about me when you proposed. You're selfish and only think about yourself. Norman was stunned by the revelation. Joan, I can't believe my ears, he said. Well, go clean them, 
Adam snapped irritably, and maybe you'll start hearing better. Joan, your taste is terrible. Does he even shower? He came to my house dressed like a homeless person, smelling like who knows what, and he's still hitting on my girlfriend. Norman couldn't bear these words and instantly punched Adam in the face. Adam was caught off guard but quickly recovered and tried to retaliate. However, Norman skillfully dodged and hit Adam in the stomach, then again in the face, causing him to fall to the ground. Before Norman could leave the house, the police arrived. The guests caught him at first, and then he was handcuffed and taken away. Ross couldn't do anything, and Joan didn't even look at her ex fiance She was too busy taking care of Adam with tears in her eyes. Norman was facing a sentence, and the case couldn't be hushed up. Adam had influential parents who would do everything to ensure that their son's offender was punished as severely as possible. Mr. Costa decided to talk to Adam's father. Through acquaintances, Mr. Costa found out at which restaurant Mr. Gottlieb was there every day. He set out specifically for the restaurant, wearing his old but still quite decent suit. Mr. Gottlieb, I am Norman's grandfather. I came to personally ask you, as a father, not to ruin the boy's life. You understand your son took Norman's fiance. We were already preparing for the wedding. Security, Mr. Gottlieb growled angrily. Is there security in this restaurant? Remove this old man from my sight. Who let him in here? Don't you care about the restaurant's image? The guard lifted Mr. Costa by the scruff of his neck and dragged him to the exit. The elderly man immediately felt bad outside. Concerned passerby called an ambulance for him, while Mr. Gottlieb indifferently watched all of this from the restaurant window. Norman was given three years in prison and served his time in full. At home, only Mrs. Banks and his loyal but noticeably aging skipper were waiting for him. Norman's grandfather didn't wait. He died two years after his grandson went to prison. After the incident at the restaurant, his heart became weak. After the prison, Norman changed. He became silent and gloomy and didn't want to go to the city anymore. He started working as a forester instead of his grandfather. He planted trees and tracked down poachers. He knew the forest like the back of his hand and served it faithfully. And the forest thanked the young forester with generous gifts. No one in their village collected as many mushrooms and berries as Norman, and for the winter he dried medicinal herbs from the forest and made delicious tea with honey. At first Norman took Skipper with him on every trip, but he soon noticed that it was difficult for the dog to walk for so long, and he began to leave him at home. Over time Skipper's paws began to fail, and Norma invited a veterinarian. However, the vet just shrugged and said, there's nothing you can do. Old age. The vet suggested putting the dog to sleep, but Norman couldn't bring himself to do it. He took care of his pet as best he could. He changed his bedding, petted him, and apologized for locking him up when Joan came to visit years ago. One morning, Norman woke up and realized Skipper had left him forever. After burying his faithful friend, Norman returned from the forest gloomily, wiping tears from his eyes. At first he didn't even notice the miniature figure at the bus stop from which he used to go to school every day. It was a skinny girl, painfully pale, dressed inappropriately for the weather. "'May I help you?' asked Norman when he finally noticed her. "'Yes, please,' the girl replied uncertainly. "'I need to find house number 25 on the 5th Street.' Why do you need that house? Norman was surprised, as the girl had just named his own address. My grandfather, Bernard Costa, lives there. I am his granddaughter and I came to see him. Norman's heart beat wildly in his chest. Could this be his sister, sent by his mother, Marilyn, whom he hadn't heard from in two decades? Is your mother's name Marilyn? He asked, his voice trembling. No, the girl replied. Her name is Dasha, and I don't have relatives with the name Marilyn. Then who is your mother, and what is your name? Norman was bewildered by the appearance of this mysterious stranger. Oh, so many questions, young man. It would be better if you showed me the house I am still looking for. 
I am already freezing and tired. I hitchhiked here. Well, Norman began, the house you are looking for is my grandfather's house. Unfortunately, he has passed away, and I live there alone now. The girl was visibly saddened. What a pity. I was going to see him. And you turn out to be my relative. A relative, but hardly by blood. Sorry, I asked your name, but I didn't introduce myself. I'm Norman. Mr. Costa was my mother's stepfather. Abigail, replied the girl. I only recently learned about him. My grandmother raised me after my mother died a long time ago. Unfortunately, my grandmother recently passed away, and my uncle immediately began dividing her property and kicked me out of my only home. I have nowhere to go. I don't work, and I have a heart defect and need surgery. Before my grandmother passed, she told me that my mother was born to a sailor. She gave me a photo and told me the name of the village. At that time, my grandmother worked as a paramedic in the port and was married, but she secretly met with this sailor. When he found out that his beloved woman was married, he broke off the relationship. Soon, my grandmother realized she was pregnant. She decided to tell him, but learned from mutual acquaintances that he had married a woman with a child. Since then, my grandmother has kept the secret of my mother's birth and only told me now. She wanted me to inherit the apartment, but she did not have time to do it, and now I am homeless. I was hoping to find my grandfather, but he has also passed away. That's my story. Norman sighed. Well, Abigail, since you're here, let's go to our grandfather's house. I warn you it's not a palace, but it's livable. I'm not used to luxury, the girl replied, smiling sadly. Abigail stayed with Norman, and Mrs. Banks listened to the girl's story, shook her head and wiped away tears. Any mention of Mr. Costa made her sad. However, Mrs. Banks liked Abigail. She's a good girl, the old woman concluded. Time passed, and one day, when Norman returned from the woods, he found Abigail lying on the floor, barely breathing. He immediately called an ambulance and tried to revive her. Abigail was taken to the hospital and transferred to the intensive care unit, while Norman waited anxiously in the hospital corridor. He was distressed about the girl because, during the short time that they were together, he had become very attached to her. Finally, a doctor came out and said that Abigail could not return home. Her heart was weak and she needed urgent surgery. The doctor handed the man a list of medicines that the girl needed and named the approximate cost of the operation that would have to be performed in the capital. Norman panicked. His grandfather had left him some savings, and Norman himself had a little money, enough for the medicine, but not for the surgery. At home, Mrs. Banks was waiting for Norman. She saw the ambulance arrive at the house and immediately ran to find out what had happened. Norman sat at the table holding his head in his hands. Mrs. Banks was frightened. Did she die? No, Norman replied. She's alive, but she needs an expensive operation. Otherwise, she'll die. I'm thinking about where I can get the money, and I need a lot. Maybe a loan of some kind? If they give it to me. Mrs. Banks thought for a moment, then stood up and said, We'll think of something. She's Bernard's own granddaughter. We have to save her. The next day, when Norman returned from another visit to the hospital, the old woman came to him again, holding a package. Here you go, she said, handing Norman the package. Norman opened it and was astonished. Money? Where did you get so much, Mrs. Banks? Yes, I saved all my life, but I have no children of my own. I can't take it to the grave, and here is such a case. We need to help a good girl. Norman couldn't hold back his tears as he hugged the old woman and thanked her from the bottom of his heart. Now Abigail would be saved. The operation was successful, but the girl remained under the observation of doctors for a long time. Norman constantly visited her and could no longer hide that he was in love. Despite her illness, Abigail was a cheerful optimist. She loved to joke, even about her illness. I always believed that after a storm caused by clouds, the sun would definitely come out, she said. It was impossible not to fall in love with such a bright and beautiful girl. Even in the hospital, 
Norman proposed to Abigail, and the girl agreed. They got married a month after discharge. They decided not to have a big wedding, since there was no one special to invite. After the wedding, Norman made sure that his young wife did not overwork herself, and even tried to do simple household chores himself. Norman, for our life together, you cooked more than I did, Abigail laughed. But this care was a joy for the man. Abigail found a common language with Mrs. Banks, and they spent winter evenings watching tearful melodramas, drinking tea with apple pie, and sympathizing with the constantly suffering heroes. Norman was amused by their women's gatherings, but he was glad that he had a family, that Abigail was happy, and that Mrs. Banks did not feel lonely. One day he was heading to watch the winter forest while thinking about home. These thoughts warmed him from the inside. The snow creaked cheerfully under his feet, and the frost grabbed his cheeks. Norman spread food in moose feeders and headed towards the road. At the edge of the forest, the forester noticed a strange sight. Is it an animal? he wondered. He walked faster and soon realized that it was a woman, completely naked, and Norman hurried to her. The woman was alive. She was shaking from the cold, sitting on her haunches and gasping for breath, visibly already at her last strength. Her long hair was disheveled and hid her face. The man immediately took off his work jacket and put it on the poor thing. She didn't say anything, just cried even more. He gave her his huge gloves and she began to silently put them on. Her fingers whitened from the cold and Norman leaned in to help. He looked at her face for the first time, and then it was as if a shock went through him. Joan? Norman, the woman even stopped chattering her teeth. How did you end up here? Joan burst into tears once again. Norman took out his phone and called the local police officer, who quickly arrived to help the girl. While they waited, Joan, trembling, confessed that she had cheated on her husband, Adam. He had caught her with her lover in a hotel room, grabbed her by the hair, dragged her out onto the street, shoved her in a car, and drove her into the woods, where he left her to die. Norman listened to this gruesome story with disgust. He had once loved Joan, and had even gone to jail for her. His grandfather had a heart attack over this story, fell out with his friend Ross because of Joan, and locked his loyal dog in a pen. However... He would never have wished such a punishment on her. How cruel does one have to be to do something like that to a woman? Moreover, Adam would probably not even face any punishment. Norman's thoughts were interrupted by the arrival of the local police officer, who took Joan away. A week later, rumours began to spread around the village that Joan and the police officer had started living together. Joan always found a way to find a warm place for herself. However, Norman was not interested in thinking about it. He had received good news from Abigail that she was pregnant. The young forester was thrilled about it, although he was worried about Abigail's heart. Everything went well, and he finally became the happiest father in the world. Abigail gave birth to a son, whom they named Bernard after their grandfather.